This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehayas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. 25 million lives have been saved. 5.5 million children have been born free of HIV AIDS. Health systems have been strengthened in a remarkable way. That was Dr. John Song, head of PEPFAR, a U.S. government program to fight AIDS on its 20 years of accomplishments. Details coming up. Also, in the Nigerian election, so far results have been released in 22 of the country's 36 states. French President Macron is heading to Central Africa for a four-nation visit. And Human Rights Watch today says Tunisia should reinstate judges and prosecutors dismissed by the president. These stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. Nigerians are still eagerly waiting for results from last Saturday's presidential election. The All Progressive Congress, APC, and People's Democratic Party, PDP, have dominated Nigeria since the end of the military rule in 1999. The new kid on the block is the little-known Labour Party, which is running for the first time to challenge the two-party system. So far, Bola Tikubu. The ruling party's candidate for president is leading after results have been released in 22 of the country's 36 states. VOA's Peter Cloti in Abuja is on the line to brief us on the latest regarding the election. Welcome to African News Tonight, Peter. Thank you very much, Yaya, for having me. So, who is leading and who is lagging? Well, um, the leading, although uh, Bola Ahmed Tunubu is leading at the moment, uh, the opposition have questioned the entire election and are calling for the immediate resignation of the INEC chairman for what they said incompetence and inability to organize free, fair, transfer, uh, tra- transparent, and credible election. They are also saying that the elections have to be rerun by a competent person. This is the latest development here in Abuja. They held a press conference this afternoon. The ADP party, PD party, PDP party, and the LPP party, the Labour Party Congress, jointly held a press conference making such demands that the election results should be cancelled because it was marred by violence, voter intimidation, harassment, and rigging. Peter, uh, this was the first national election where an electronic device has been used to accredit voters. So is the culprit here the electronic device? Well, um, I, am, I am glad you mentioned the use of electronic devices. INEC promised ahead of the election for many months that the electronic device would be used for the transmission of the election results. It did not happen. That is the main reason why all these opposition parties and even international poll observers as well as local poll observers are are saying the election lacks transparency because over 80% of the use of the transmission of the BVAS or the electronic transmission system refused or did not take place. Only a handful. Now, there was a huge gap between when polls closed and when the results started coming in, creating the impression, according to these opposition groups, that it creates the avenue for manipulation and voter tampering. They, of course, they had their own situation room. They tallied some of the results coming from the uh, field. And some of the figures they had assigned by their representatives at the poll do not reflect what INEC had and INEC declared. Uh, for example, they cited Lagos State, where over 3 million, or over 3 million po- people voted. But the vote that came was less than 2 million. So they just dismissed it as a, uh, as a sham election. And that is why they are calling for a rerun and the resignation of the INEC chairman. This is getting a, re- a little serious. The People's Democratic uh, Party, the PDP representative, I think at the election center in the capital Abuja, where you are, described the process as fraudulent and accused the governing All Progressive Congress, APC, of colluding with, of all people, INEC, the Nigerian Election Commission. 
How can that be? Talking about well, talking about the seriousness of it, uh, yeah, yes. the joint press conference held by the PDP, the ADC, and the Labour Party Congress warned that they can only control their supporters for so long, and that if these illegalities, as they describe, a fraudulent election keeps on going on, they will not be able to uh, uh, hold back their supporters because most of their supporters are youth who were enthusiastic, who went in and, and, and voted. But a lot of people that I spoke with said, I next over promised and under delivered the electronic transmission system, which would have ensured transparency, they said, failed to, uh, uh, to be taken, uh, to be used for the election, thereby doubting the credibility and transparency of the election. And that is why they want the election to be scrapped, a new one, re rerun and the, a new person, they said a competent person to be, to be appointed to run the election. And they are also calling for a full-scale investigation into allegations of malpractice, irregularities, voter intimidation, harassment. Some, some voters were even killed. Others' uh, violence were unleashed. For example, in Lagos, uh, there were a lot of shops uh, uh, by evil people who uh, were attacked. Some of the shops burned down, although the, those who were accused of doing it said they did not have a hand in doing so. So the situation uh, a lot of people are telling me it stands right now coupled with the currency shortage it's not a good system. Our man in Abuja, VOA's Peter Cloty, excellent reporting thank you for your input. Thank you very much. And in more on the elections, according to some places, the Bio model voters accreditation system machine, BIVAS, which is used to transmit election results, malfunctioned and could not upload data to the Electoral Commission's main server in time. Some voters who spoke to reporter Mike Mbonye were not happy with the delay. I'm Mrs. Priscilla Johnson. I'm a businesswoman. I deal on foodstuffs. Okay, actually based on the way the election was conducted from our own polling center where we are, I don't actually see me to be right. Because most persons were being forced to comprint where they actually don't want to. In the sense that they want a higher number for that party or for their own candidate. So we, it's a wrong idea in the way they are counting the process because it is not clean. So we would say, for my own opinion, the counting process in my pooling unit was wrong. What do you think should be done to remedy the situation? It has been done. So I will say, why we look at the next coming election, we look at how it won't occur again because... We, we actually thought the uh, electronics uh, counting beavers that came would do a better job. But to the best of our knowledge, some failed, some didn't even function at all. So for my own opinion and advice, I prefer the old pattern. INEC should come back. It should be done back. Most places should be redone. I learned some places were cancelled, so I think I buy that idea of cancellation for the normal thing to be done. My name is Onyema. I'm a business lady. Well, for the counting what is going on for the election, I can't taste what is not right. Because from every polling unit we know, my own polling, polling unit, the number is high and every other people have lamented on their own numbers so i don't understand why INEC is doing all those things that they are doing they should forget all the mago mago and do this and count this election proper because as nigeria is now nigerians are looking at them so they have to follow the due process and make sure that the good result is done those were the views of some Nigerian voters on the vote counting process. They spoke with reporter Mike Mboni in Port Harcourt, Nigeria. French President Emmanuel Macron 
heads to Central Africa tomorrow on a four-nation visit just hours after announcing a revamped relationship with Africa amid an increase in anti-French sentiment in some places and rising Russian and Chinese influence. From Paris, Lisa Bryant has more on Macron's Africa visit and reaction to his proposals. Au fond, la logique, c'est que notre modèle ne doit plus être celui de base militaire telle qu'elles existent aujourd'hui. Partnership, humility and reorganization are part of President Macron's lexicon this week with his new recalibrated strategy for Africa. He said French military bases in Africa would be reorganized, with some becoming military academies or run in collaboration with African and European partners, based on goals defined by African hosts. La réorganisation que j'évoquais tout à l'heure... He said France will conduct more training, supply more equipment, and work more closely with local troops according to their needs. Macron also said France must show a profound humility and carve out a new, balanced and mutually responsible relationship with African nations. Macron's revamped Africa strategy will be put to the test this week as he heads first to Gabon on Wednesday for a summit on forests. He then goes to visit Angola, the Republic of Congo and the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. Only two countries on his list, Gabon and the Republic of Congo, are former French colonies. His Africa visit follows setbacks for France, especially in the Sahel region, as a partnership to fight an Islamist insurgency unravels. France has ended military operations in Mali and Burkina Faso amid deteriorating relationships with the military power holders and rising anti-French sentiment. Paris is also feeling pressure from other foreign powers on the continent. That includes the private Russian military group Wagner, present in places like Mali and the Central African Republic, where it is accused of committing human rights violations. Pour ce qui est de Wagner. Macron derided Wagner as a so-called life insurance policy for failed regimes and putschists. His government accuses Russia of spreading anti-French disinformation. The past 10 to 15 years, every, every French president comes to power with the idea of sort of reforming the relationship with Africa, sort of moving um, beyond the, the old legacy of, of post-colonial relations. Martin Kenzis is the Paris office director for the German Marshall Fund. He spoke to VOA before Macron's speech. He says every recent reset effort has failed. Shortly after becoming president in 2017, Macron called for turning a new page in French-African relations at a meeting with university students in Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso. It didn't happen the way he planned, at least not in Burkina Faso. Macron right now is in a position where clearly France has lost influence in a region where they, we've invested a lot of money and military, uh, um, military capa- capacity in the region. The results are, are, are quite uh, uh, limited, to say the least. It's not clear how Macron's latest recalibration effort will fare. Some Africans interviewed by French media said they heard nothing new in Macron's speech, but others were more receptive. Speaking to France's TV5 Monde, Aliou Tine, founder of Dakar-based research group the Africa Jam Center, noted Macron was addressing not just African allies, but countries like Mali, where France has problems. He said it was good the French president was trying to improve ties, but that it takes two to do so. Separately, Macron's push to return African artifacts taken during colonial times has also drawn praise, and objects have been returned to Benin and Senegal. He announced draft legislation to return objects to more African countries. Lisa Bryant for VOA News, Paris. Human Rights Watch today said Tunisian authorities should immediately reinstate judges and prosecutors that President Kais Saeed has dismissed as part of his anti-corruption campaign. The Justice Ministry has refused to reinstate 49 magistrates despite an administrative court order in August to do so, a ruling that HRW says authorities cannot appeal. Instead, the Justice Minister announced the preparation of criminal cases against 
the dismissed judges. In 2021, Saeed said he would take over supervision of public prosecution and unilaterally dissolve the High Judicial Council, a constitutional body that guarantees the independence of the judiciary. Today, its members are appointed, including nine directly by the president. Saeed also said he has the power to intervene in the appointment, career tracks, and dismissal of magistrates, some of whom he has accused of moral corruption and obstructing investigations. In some cases, lawyers supporting the magistrates face charges of publicly criticizing the government's moves. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. The head of a U.S. government program to fight AIDS, Dr. John Nkengasong, says that in its 20 years of existence, the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, or PEPFAR, has saved 25 million lives. Ket Bartlett reports from Johannesburg on the milestone and the future in the fight against HIV. PEPFAR, set up in 2003 under the administration of former U.S. President George W. Bush, has transformed the trajectory of HIV-AIDS, Nkenga Song told reporters Tuesday while visiting South Africa. 25 million lives have been saved. 5.5 million children have been born free of HIV-AIDS. Our systems, health systems have been strengthened in a remarkable way. In Kengasong, who comes from Cameroon, said there was once a sense of hopelessness in Africa, the continent worst hit by HIV AIDS. But since then, countries' economies have increased and life expectancy has improved. Some 95% of the total $110 billion spent through PEPFAR was spent on Africa as it bore the brunt of the disease, he said. Before PEPFAR, only 50,000 people thousand people on the continent of Africa who were infected were on treatment, 50,000. Today, over 20 million people are, are, are receiving life-saving uh, antiretroviral therapy. Nkenga Song said the infrastructure rolled out across Africa as part of the U.S. government program was also useful during the COVID-19 pandemic. The AIDS official said he was also very positive about the tools in the pipeline to combat HIV, including the rollout of pre-exposure prophylactics for HIV-negative people that can be injected every three months and will stop the spread of new infections. Kate Bartlett for VOA News, Johannesburg. Sudan's ruling military reviewed an agreement with Russia to build a navy base in strategic Port Sudan on the Red Sea. Officials say Moscow has met Sudan's most recent demands, including providing more weapons and equipment. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said the deal still needs ratification by Sudan's yet-to-be-formed legislative body. Dave DeRoche Professor of Center for Strategic Studies of National Defense University, discuss the strategic impact of the agreement with VOA senior analyst Mohammed El Shinawi. It's long been an ambition of Russia to have bases in the Red Sea, and Sudan would seem to be the most likely candidate as it had been the, you know, a very non-aligned country that also didn't have overly strong relations with the Gulf partners of the United States. But the initial Russian negotiations were concluded before Sudan joined the Abraham Accords. What I think we're seeing here is a longstanding Sudanese practice of trying to extract max goodies out of various partners. And here, I don't think the partner that they're going to extract things from is Russia. I think this is aimed at the United States and to a lesser extent, Israel. We've heard this story before. The issue is always you can make an agreement with the Sudanese leadership, but they say, well, it has to be ratified by our legislature. We don't have a legislature yet. That's a really good negotiating tactic because it allows Sudan to basically pocket concessions, pocket promises, and then see if they will be matched by the West. It's important to note that Sudan only came off of uh, terrorist sanctions, a support of sponsorship of terrorist sanctions as a result of signing the Abraham Accords. And if it develops a large naval base, it could be subject to CATSA sanctions. So Russian naval might in particular has been discredited in recent months. I mean, the Black Sea Fleet, which was the only 
fleet of the Russian Navy with a regular freshwater port is combat ineffective. It's basically a virtual prisoner in Novorossiysk. It's had to abandon Crimea. So I don't think, and Russia's ability to produce advanced weapons is questionable. So I don't think this is a, a done deal. And I don't think this is as significant as Sergei Lavrov says it's going to be. He's announced that this deal has been concluded at least three times, but there's always the same obstacles. But what's the strategic impact of such an agreement as part of Moscow's efforts to restore regular naval presence in various parts of the globe? If it goes through, it will be a big strategic advancement for Russia. It won't be as big as the establishment of the port of Tartus, because Tartus, it's much easier, closer, can support 11 ships. What we're hearing of this agreement is it's a maximum of four ships, and the ability to support them from Port Sudan is limited just because it's more difficult for supplies to get in there. And the amount of basic presence allowed is relatively small. It's only 300 sailors. Uh, But it will be strategically significant. It will allow Russia to have a permanent presence in the Red Sea. The United States does not have basing facility in the Red Sea. We only have them on the other side of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, So it would be a major, major development. But again, it remains to be seen if it can happen. And it remains to be seen if Russia has the strategic resources, even if an agreement were concluded, if they have the weapons, the money, and the strategic depth to actually position ships in uh, Port Sudan. In 2017, Moscow struck a deal with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to extend its lease of Syrian Port Tartus for 49 years after signing the agreement that allows Russia to keep up to 11 warships there, it has moved to modernize and expand that facility. How could a base on the Red Sea and another one on the Mediterranean revive the Soviet era practice of constantly rotating its warships in strategic locations? It could revive this practice, but there's a couple of factors that come into play. The first is the strategic exhaustion of Russia and the Russian military. Two years ago, the idea that Russia would be importing weapons from Iran, that was ridiculous. It was laughable. What we've seen since then is that Russia is pretty much on the ropes in terms of military production. And 